Hello everyone, welcome to SIUK India webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We are now live with Henle Business School. Today we have Vishali with us who will let us know more about this special webinar session. Please feel free to post all the questions in the chat box on the right. We will answer all the questions after the presentation during the Q&A session. So let's start. Over to you, Vishali. Thanks, Deepika. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Deepika said, my name is Vishali, and I'm the Senior Regional Manager at Hendy Business School, University of Reading, looking after student recruitment uh, for India, Middle East and Africa. Um, I'm going to quickly share my presentation so you can see what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to try and talk to you about um, how to create a strong master's application for Henley courses. But before that, on agenda, I also want to cover a little bit about um, an overview of Henley Business School, the master's courses we offer, our entry requirements and application process, and then, of course, the main agenda, which would be how to write a strong personal statement, um, which was a major part of your application, uh, as well as uh, I'll be talking about the scholarships that are available for 2022 intake, uh, the application process for scholarships, as well as um, how to make the best impression for your scholarship application. So um, firstly about us. Um, so if you don't already know about us, then Henley Business School began life in Greenland's Henley on Thames at the end of Second World War. Our history spans over seven decades. We were founded in 1945, and we happen to be one of the oldest business schools in the UK. The picture you are seeing in the left side corner is actually where we began life, our Greenland's campus. We're also part of University of Reading, which has a very rich history in itself. It, it's over 21, 25 years. And we actually began like a satellite college, an extension college of University of, of Oxford, and then got our own Royal Charter status. In fact, we are one of the only university to get a Royal Charter between the two world wars. Now, Henley, um, when we talk about Henley, you know, over the seven decades, uh, the programs we offer, the research we do, and the individuals attending the programs have diversified. But what remains at the heart of everything we do is bringing real life examples into our teaching. So whether it is bringing research white papers for discussion, using case studies, group seminars, or taking students out on industrial visits or study trips. For our student, it is about living, breathing, and creating business. So it is only fitting to say that Henley is where business comes to life. We're also one of the only uh, of the 100 business schools in the world to hold a triple accreditation status. And this is a testament of the quality and the high standards of our courses and faculty. In, if we talk about rankings, we are ranked very highly. Again, we're ranked seventh in the UK for Masters in Finance and 11th in the UK for Masters in Management Program. It's the unique values and uh, approach that un underpins everything we do and which is why we do so well in rankings. We're also a global business school uh, in more than one sense. We have six international campuses and a number of partnerships worldwide. But also talking about our dynamic and engaging alumni community, we've got over 87,000 alumni across 160 countries. Each year at Henley, we've got over 7,000 students studying from over 150 different countries. Our students also benefit from all the professional affiliations we've got with the bodies like CIMA, CIPD, Chartered Institute of Management, CFA, GARP, RICS, and so on. Not just they are able to get exemptions, but they also find themselves in a competitive place when they finish their degree course. Our students also benefit from the state-of-art facilities. And when I talk about this, the students not just have access to the, um, you know, to the business school libraries, but also the main library of the University of Reading, and also students studying finance at the business school, which is under the ICMA wing, have have over you know, have the 
uh, ability to practice what they're learning, so apply what they're learning through the trading room simulation experience. We've got over 100 uh, terminals with, you know, which are which have all the necessary software sponsored by Thomson Reuters and Bloomberg. So students have access to these facilities. So where are we? We've got two campuses in the UK. Uh, the first being, of course, the Greenlands Henley on Thames campus, which is um, uh, which is 12 miles apart from our Reading campus, which is White Knights campus in Reading. Uh, so we are on the university's White Knights campus. It's just about 30 minutes from central London. Uh, so very close to London, just outside London. Uh, so a, a train from London Paddington would take you about 30 minutes to get to Reading. It's, Reading is also called as the Silicon Valley of UK. It has um, you know, headquarters for Microsoft, Oracle, uh, but, with, but it also has in our offices um, uh, like Huawei, Ericsson, PepsiCo. So it's, it's a great hub if you're um, looking for from a career point of view. Uh, it's also very close to uh, the two major airports of uh, London, that is Heathrow and Gatwick. Um, you, and you've got good rail air code service and train service between both the stations, both the places. Uh, it's also the regional hub for culture, shopping and green space. And talking about green space, our White Knights campus is uh, a testament of, of it. I'm going to share with you some pictures of our White Knights campus. It's um, it's got a lot of um, a, a, you know green space for our students to be able to reflect on, but it's also got a beautiful natural lake on campus, and we've got a garden called Harris Garden, which um, our students uh, enjoy during uh, summer. It's got trees from all over the world. Um, it, it's something or somewhere in lines of what you'd find in Kew Gardens. In, in London. So, uh, and we've also got uh, the Queen's Green Flag Award for 11 years in the row. So that's a testament of the, um, of the campus and how beautiful it looks, uh, you know. Uh, now, these are some of the pictures of our Greenlands campus. So uh, as I said, this is where our, um, you know, Henley Business School began life. Uh, now our students have access to both the campuses. Of course, the undergrad and master students are usually based out of the White Knights campus, but they do have the opportunity to come to Greenlands campus for any networking events or for uh, just, you know, to make use of the study spaces available here. Uh, this campus is mostly uh, used by our MBA students or by our executive education uh, uh, team, which is uh, where we work with uh, industry people to provide open and custom programs. Uh, so if you're looking to, again, network with people from the industry, it's a great place to come, come to. Now, this is a full list of all the master's courses that we offer at Henley. Um, as you can see, there are, uh, uh, you know, they're broadly in five major subject areas, accounting, business and management, finance, uh, information management and digital business and real estate and planning. Uh, but the full list of programs is, is over here. We we'll leave you the links to our website, uh, especially for the master's pages. So you can look at uh, the programs in depth after the session or during the session. Now, coming to the main topic for today's presentation, which is about um, how to create a strong application. Now, before you write your application, there are things that are going to matter and are going to impact on how well you write your application or your statement of purpose. And so for that purpose, what we say is you do some sort of preparation. You need to do your own research before you start writing your application. What you need to do is you need to start looking at the course pages on the website. You need to think through about the programs, but not just about the programs or the broad areas that you're interested in, but also about the modules, because a lot of these programs, like if I give an example, marketing as an example here, has pathways into digital marketing, international marketing and consumer marketing. And you might find yourself uh, more passionate or more aligned because of the career you're currently in. Uh, or inter just your general interest uh, that you want to pick up a specific uh, pathway or you're able to, that there's just one program like the MSc Management Program, but you're able to tailor the program to your needs because of the number of optional modules that are available. So it's very important that you look through the course pages to understand what the compulsory modules or the optional modules are, 
Also, these programs are des designed with certain career outcomes. So you need to understand whether this program really meets the needs of your career aspirations. You also want to look at the course duration, the type of um, you know, uh, teaching and learning methodology that we apply. For example, uh, how applied is the program? Uh, you know, do you have business projects? Do you have dissertations? Or do you go out on study trips or industrial visits? How does this program support you with learning in a more applied format? So that's something that you want to research about. Certain students might prefer a more theoretical approach, others might uh, you know, prefer more applied approach. So you want to see how this kind of the program you're interested in meets your needs. You also want to look at the entry requirements. Uh, this is more important for certain programs because there might be certain kind of background that we'd be expecting the student to come from. An example here uh, would be accounting students. Uh, now we do look for a certain level of accounting modules in their bachelor's degree. So, um, and, and let's say you did do an accounting related program. Uh, it's not just, how many modules you had, but whether it would impact if that means that whether you have more than sufficient modules covered already in your bachelor's and therefore whether you're eligible for this program or not. So you'll have to, there are a number of reasons why you'd want to see um, what the entry requirements are. Or for example, for a finance program, we do require quantitative modules in your bachelor's degree. So whether you have those within your bachelor's degree, and if not, is there any preparatory exams that might be required of you like a GMAT or a GRE? So it's important that you do that research. We also suggest your students to talk to current students or alumni to see um, where, what they think of our programs, of what, of how well it, you know, they came prepared for the program, or uh, what they thought during the program of their, um, you know, whether it met their expectations and so on, or what challenges did they find during the program. All of this research will help you prepare well for the program. Once you've done that and you've collated all that information, it's important to see um, what that means to you. Think, this is especially if you're thinking to apply for that program, you need to know why you are applying and whether you really want to study a master's at this stage. So you need to evaluate from all the information you have done as a part of your research and found out, you want to sit down and think about when you're applying, what you want to apply for and why you're applying. Now, you can apply if you don't worry if you've not got everything mapped out, you can apply to more than one course, for example, you could apply if you're not sure within marketing, whether you want to go for, a, you know, a digital marketing or an international marketing, you don't need to make that decision, you can apply for more than one course, but it's very important that you take care of the choices, you know, the subject choices you, you make. For example, uh, you, what you don't want is you, want, you don't want to apply for accounting and then you want to apply for a real estate program because um, unless, of course, you've got a good reasoning and that's something then you'll have to map it out in your personal statements. Uh, now, when you do apply for more than one program, you will have the opportunity to tailor your personal statement. So, so long as you give that understanding to the uh, to the admissions officer there would be questions that you'll raise if in case they're very diverse programs also remember some students not just apply for the management business management programs at the business school but they also are sometimes looking at the wider university program for example they might be looking at economics department or they might be looking at psychology now how does this fit in between all the career plans that you have. So it's very important that you, you bring the relevance through the subject choices you make. Once you've got, you've done this bit of research and you've decided what program you apply, you, it's important you also make note of the application deadlines. Now, for most of the Henley programs, you don't have an application deadline. However, for all international students, we do suggest that you apply as soon as possible, but latest by the 1st of June. But I'm also going to say here that you, you want to think about the scholarships that you are looking for or the bursaries you're planning to apply for if you've got a funding need. Because there might be scholarship deadlines or there might be bursary deadlines. And if 
you're able to apply for a scholarship or a bursary only if you hold an offer for the program. So you do want to do that kind of back work in terms of the dates uh, to think about how how long will it take for you to get a decision on your application to be able to apply in good time for your scholarship or bursary. Once you've taken note of that, it's important you then also start thinking about the documents that are required as part of your application. So you have them in good time to be able to make the application. Some documents can wait, uh, others might be prerequisite for making a decision. It might be absolutely necessary. So you have to sort that out and know which are important documents and are mandatory and minimum for the admissions to be able to take a decision. And I'll get to that in a bit. It's also important you think about how you're going to be funding for your master's program, but also your stay during here in the UK. So you want to know about what kind of living expenses you can expect if you're coming to Reading and whether you've got the required funding. There are a number of scholarships provided by the university and the business school, but there are also other scholarship opportunities available probably by more, uh, more which are more external, but also by uh, private funding bodies or government funding bodies in your own country. So you do want to try and do that research alongside looking at what scholarships are available um, by the, from the university or from the business school. Now, um, preparing to apply, I did talk about the two things that are primary in your research, which is thinking about entry requirements and the kind of documents that are required. Now, um, for the business school, our requirement is a 2-1 equivalent or bow in the undergraduate degree. As I mentioned previously, for some programs, especially like the ICMA finance programs, we may ask for a GMAT if we don't see that you've got sufficient quantitative advanced, ma advanced mathematics or statistics modules in your bachelor's degree. We also have IELTS requirement. For most programs, you're looking for overall 6.5 with no elements less than six. But for information management and digital business programs, we're looking for 6.5 overall with no elements less than 5.5. Now, if you're coming from India, we do provide English language waiver based on your 12th English score. So if you're coming from a CBSE or an ICSE board, then we accept 70% in your English um, in 12th and 75% for all of the boards. Talking about what kind of documents will be required, at the stage of application, if you've still not finished your uh, bachelor's degree, then it might not be possible for you to gather your graduation certificate or your degree certificate. So you can provide that at a later date. Um, but if you've already uh, finished your undergraduate degree, you've been working for a few years, then this is something you might, you know, you might have to provide at, at the application stage. Um, Transcripts, now official academic transcripts is another important document. Again, if you've not finished, then you can provide this at a later date. But what we need from you is we need to see um, a, a, um, a, all, the, all the mark sheets of the semesters you've studied so far. Uh, you can provide a consolidated mark sheet or you can provide um, just, you know, just scan all the separate semesters mark sheets and make it as a one PDF. A statement of purpose that is a mandatory document, evidence of your English language proficiency, uh, we accept IELTS, PT, TOEFL, TEEP, 12th mark sheet, as I said, so you can provide these if you, if you haven't um, Apply, uh, you haven't appeared for IELTS so far and you don't meet the 12th grade uh, cutoff, then you can provide this at later date at the application stage. You can just mention that you plan to appear for the IELTS TOEFL or whatever exam you're planning for. We also need two references. You, uh, you can provide, if you have them, you can provide them as a, a scanned copy of the letters that you've got from your refer referees, or you can provide the referees details. Um, what will happen is that once you submit the application, an email will be automatically generated to your referees, who will then have, uh, who will then have a certain period of time to be able to respond to our email. Now, one of the things that we do suggest is that you you get your referee's official or professional email address. Um, our admissions team do not like um, personal email addresses uh, of, of the referees. Uh, so 
when I say personal, anything ending with Yahoo or Gmail or any other such Hotmail or any other such accounts, it's preferable that you get the professional work email addresses. And if you can't get these, then um, it's best you get um, a reference in, in a letterhead from your university. Now, usually we do require two academic references, but if you've been, um, uh, if you've finished your uh, degree a few years uh, back and you're now currently working, you've been, um, you've been away from studies, then we understand and we are happy to take one professional uh, reference uh, and one academic reference. Uh, now, these are not mandatory documents. The references can wait. Um, so it's not something that we needed absolutely at an application stage. We are able to make a decision so far we see that the academic requirements are met and the personal statement shows clear motivation of, uh, and, and, and is, is at a good level. So we're able to make a decision with that. A copy of your passport is mandatory document. Uh, we will need this uh, at the stage of your application. Also, if you've been working, we would recommend you provide a CV. If you've studied for a professional qualification like um, a CA or an ACCA uh, or um, CMA, any CFA, any of these, uh, whether you're level one or a level three, if, whatever you've finished, if you provide those uh, certificates um, uh, or mark sheets, that would be helpful. If you've, if you've already appeared for GMAT or IELTS, then it's preferable you, apply, uh, you provide these at the stage of application. Moving on. So talking about the um, application process itself, I'd like to remind that there's no application fee for any Henley courses. And you are able to apply through our online application portal, which is www.reading.ac.uk forward slash PG apply. At the application, so once you are in this link, you, you will be asked to register an account you will need to provide your name, your date of birth, and your email address of the, as the bare minimum to create an account. You will then be sent a link uh, through which you can create your application. You can save and you can come back. So you don't have to complete the application in one go. It's in the save and return format. So you can, you can fill the minimum. And then once you are ready, you can come back and you can finish your application. Now, most uh, fields in the um, application portal, uh, which are bare minimum of what is required for making a decision will be mandatory fields, but there might be certain fields which are not mandatory or not compulsory. But we do suggest that you provide as much information as possible because that will impact the decision of the uh, admissions board. And this is more um, relevant sometimes where you don't meet the standard requirements. You may not have the academic requirement, but you've got supporting experience, work experience, which might make your case slightly different. And therefore, all of these um, sections, which may not be mandatory, are still very relevant for an admissions officer to make decisions. So we do encourage people to provide as much information as possible. When you apply um, each section, when, when you're filling the form, each section as you finish will show a green tick, which means you've completed. And therefore, if you haven't finished anything and you're trying to save or you're trying to submit, it will prompt you saying you've not finished and you might want to go back and check if there's a section which does not have a green tick. Once um, uh, one application is submitted, you can then add your second or third or fourth. Uh, application for other courses, uh, if you wish to apply for more than one course. If, um, if you're providing more than one document, there, there are sections which talks about the kind of documents that we need from you. But sometimes we may not be able to accept more than one document in certain fields. So it's, it's suggested that you scan them uh, together and make a PDF file. Uh, so you, it's, it's a one file and has all the information that we're looking for. Um, we also don't recommend you create a zip file. It's, it's best if you follow either a Word or a PDF format. And you keep the file size between two to five megabytes, nothing more than that. Also, if you're using Apple Mac, uh, remember that some documents, when we open, we might not be able to read them or it might be, uh, it might show up, it might throw up an error. So we do recommend that you convert them as much as possible into a PDF or a Word format. 
Now, normally, um, we, we do see a lot of people providing a lot of honors certificates or prizes or awards that they've received. Not all of it might be relevant. Not all of it is something we require. You can mention all the awards or prizes uh, at your school or colleges that you won within your personal statement, but you don't really need to provide them as a proof. Uh, you don't need to scan those documents because it just adds to the file size. So, Coming to your personal statement part, uh, we, what we recommend is that you first make a list covering your interest, your understanding, your motivations, your skills and qualities. And then be selective of what you want to present, what is relevant and what is important for the program that you're applying for. It's also important you organize your thoughts in terms of the structure you want to you form, you want to form, whether you want to take a story approach or you, whether you want to make it more descriptive of your of how you've um, you've made your journey so far. So it, it, you need to organize. You don't want to jump over from one place to the other uh, other without making a clear, uh, giving a clear picture or an idea to the admissions officer. So from that sense, the tone, the language is very important. And it's also important that you try and keep your personal statement no more than 500 words. It's okay if you go over a little bit more, but you know, don't try and make it too long. That's one thing that probably might uh, slightly put off the admissions team or the program directors uh, if they are uh, if they are looking at your application, especially when you may not be meeting the standard requirements. So it's very important, therefore, that once you've written your application, you show to other people, to your family, your friends who know you, who understand you, and why you're coming from, why you're making these decisions, to see if it makes sense to them. If not, rewrite or make changes based on what you see. Uh, what kind of feedback they provide. Once you've done that, we also recommend that you proofread it for any uh, things that you may have missed out, but also for simple things like grammatical error or spelling, er spelling mistakes. That's the last thing you want um, to be shown on your application. You're coming for a master's program and you will be uh, you know, academically challenged. Uh, the kind of uh, assignments you will be writing, the kind of presentations you'll be making, they are gonna be very challenging. And we want to make sure that when you're coming to our program, you are able to you know, withstand that kind of uh, challenge and pressure and the com nature of competition, competition uh, that you'll face with, with your peers on the program. So it's very important you proofread. Also at this stage, it's very obvious, but a lot of times we do see people, we know people apply for more than one university and it's absolutely fine, but you do want to make sure that you've checked not once, but you know, five times, 10 times that you've, you're applying, you've written the right university name, right business school name or the right program name in your application. So another big reason why you want to proofread your application. So now talking about um, personal statement, um, how do you go about writing it? You have to be very careful about how you're going to open your personal statement. A lot of people think, you know, uh, or they, they prefer starting off with a quotation and it's not always necessary. Uh, it's not always the best way to start your personal statement. Don't use that unless you think it is relevant to you. Don't use that if you think it's important, or pertinent to what you're going to say about yourself. Because remember that it is going to take, you know, that space or, or that word, word limit that you've got from, your, from everything else that you want to say about yourself. So not always it's the best way. Include any relevant experiences you've got within your personal statement, whether it's professional, whether it's voluntary experiences, you may have done uh, uh, work which may not be part of your, um, you know, your, your uh, actual life in terms of after your degree. Uh, it may not be paid jobs, it may be unpaid jobs, it may be uh, internships. Talk about what you learned from those, what were your learnings, to focus on the learnings from these experiences. It's very important to us that you are thinking about why this university, why business school, why Henley Business School. So you need to bring that in, uh, very, in a very evident way in your personal statement. You need to show us the clarity of why you're choosing or your interest for a certain course. 
what's your motivation? What really prompted you? Was it the passion for the subject? Or if you're not from the, that relevant background, is it something that you've been reading in the newspapers or in business magazines, which has really made you passionate about a certain subject area? Or maybe you're working in that field and you feel that there is a gap or a, a, a lack of structured learning, which is which has motivated you to go on for a master's program. For every person, there's a different reason. Um, and that would come through. That would really show through if you've thought about it in depth. So make sure you show that as part of your application, as part of your personal statement. It's also good for us to see that you've understood what the course outcomes are. So try and map that out in your personal statement and how the course will add value to you. To your career plans. So not always have you mapped it out and that's fine. But if you have mapped it out, then you want to say why this program is going to bridge the gap or uh, give you something extra uh, that you probably don't already have. So try and talk about that aspect. It's also important to cover why we should choose you. So we get loads of application. And so we want to be selective and we want to bring high potential students on our program. So it's important you tell us what makes you a good student. What is it that you can offer to your peers on the program? What can they learn from you? So focus on that aspect. Avoid talking negatively about yourself over here unless there is a positive outcome of what you learned from your negative experiences. Remember, if you don't say the entire story, you're not giving much for the admissions officer to understand about yourself. They don't know you as a person. So if you just talk negatively and you don't talk what the positive outcome was, they just wouldn't know. And that would just raise unnecessary questions in their, um, in their mind. An example here is uh, talking about, um, you know, if you've, if you've got backlogs, you know, if you just leave at why you've got a backlog, why you didn't clear in first attempt, that leaves a negative impression and that questions of why, uh, you know, of whether you'd be able to, um, you know, meet up with our academic uh, requirements, unless there is a reason, a, a real reason why you want to mention it. Um, and, and there is a positive outcome. For example, it may have been in semester one semester or semester two or whenever, and then you've gone on to do really well in your, um, in your uh, other semesters, you know, you know, in your later part of your degree or those, those specific uh, modules were not relevant to you and therefore you probably, but you need to map that journey or that story. If not, you're leaving a negative impression and that's not a good thing. What are you hoping to do after the course? That's very important. Don't worry if you, as I've, I've said, don't worry if you've not got everything mapped out, but we do want to see somewhere, especially if you've got some work experience or if you've, um, uh, you know, you, you know why you're coming to this course and what kind of career outcomes you're, you're expecting. If there, there's a certain role that you're targeting in your career, um, you know, or if there's a certain company that you're targeting and you know that there's that industry link or there's that uh, support that Henley provides, which, which makes it important for you to be here. So do, do make sure that you know uh, why you're or what you're hoping to get from that course. Remember, there are no right answers. Each personal statement is, you know, different and um, it's, it's about you. So it, it's your personal story. And so we, we take it and we look at it that way. So there are no right and wrong answers here. Okay, so let's move on. Now, what happens after I have applied? Well, you will be receiving an email con confirming that your application has been submitted. Uh, it will also go to the admissions officer where it will be assessed and a decision will be made if we have all the information available to us. If we need more information or we need to interview you for any reason, we will contact you. So keep an eye on your emails. It should take no more than four weeks to hear from us. Usually we are very good. We do get back in one, one week or even less than that sometimes, but you know, each, uh, each application is different and uh, the time of the year, all of that will matter, but no later than four weeks. Your offer will be sent by email and will state any conditions that you need to meet. 
So for example, if there's references or there's, uh, if you haven't finished your degree, then it will say the percentage you need to meet from your university as a condition on your offer. If you've got your offer, whether conditional or unconditional, you're able to accept your offer through the RISES portal. Uh, for accepting your offer, you will have to pay a deposit, which is usually a thousand pounds deposit. This will confirm your place on the program. And all you need to do is if you have any conditions, meet that before the start of the program. Talking about scholarships, uh, this is a full list of all the scholarships that are uh, you know, broadly available within the university and business school this year. Uh, Felix Scholarship, unfortunately, this is now closed. It is it, it was the fully funded scholarships for Indian citizens. But what we've got currently is the University of Reading Centenary Scholarship. So to uh, celebrate, um, you know, 100 years of our Royal Charter status, we are giving away 100 scholarships worth, each worth of £4,000 to international master's students. There, there were two deadline dates of which one has already passed uh, we've gone past, which was 1st of March, but there's another deadline of 15th of June. So if you, you can hurry up now, if, you, if you'd want to apply for one of these, one of the scholarships. There are also subject specific scholarships, uh, which are handy ones, which I'll talk about, which I'll show in terms of the list of scholarships that are available. But generally speaking, we've got about a million pound of uh, scholarship funds available to support high potential candidates. These scholarships are awarded on a rolling basis. What that means is that the applications are reviewed on a monthly basis. If you receive a scholarship, you will receive a notification of the award and you will have to accept within four weeks. Scholarships are awarded on a merit basis. So it's important that we see that you've or there's, it's important for us that there's an evidence that you've got academic excellence um, or any relevant work experience that, that would make you a strong candidate. Students are able to apply for both centenary scholarship and subject scholarships. And if they win both the scholarships, they're able to combine them together, which means potentially you can increase the value of the scholarship for more than £4,000 if you won both the centenary and the subject scholarship. We've also got alumni management, master's in management bursary, which is worth £10,000. This is slightly different from the scholarship and is awarded based on um, the financial need of the student. And so there's an additional requirement that we ask uh, we, uh, students to fulfill, which will be providing um, evidence of either tax statements or bank statements to prove that they've got a financial need. Now, scholarships uh, and bursaries usually take the form of a tuition fee reduction and can be applied through the MEAT Reading portal. This is the full list of the scholarships that are available. They are available between the range of £2,000 to £10,000. Uh, this is also available on our website and we'll share the link uh, to the scholarship page for you to look at at a later date. In, in terms of tips on scholarship application, now, um, it's most of these scholarship applications are not got, are, are kind of combined with your personal statement. So you've got the opportunity of writing more than that 500 words um, that you've written for your personal statement, providing more details about why you should receive the scholarship. So take every opportunity to tell about all your achievements that you were not able to talk about on the personal statement. Talk about the strengths, about your skills, your experiences that you were not able to talk on the personal statement. Don't talk about the same thing that you have provided in your personal statement on this scholarship application, because when your application goes to the panel, we will be attaching your personal statement along with it. So make sure you talk about things apart from what you already mentioned in your personal statement. We want to know what makes you unique. So it's very important you talk about your experiences, which you think are, are very different from other people, you know, whether it's life experiences or work experiences, it's, it's important you tell your story. Again, Talk about what you think you will bring to Henley. So how do you think you'll add value to the Henley alumni community or to the current students, not just within your program, but outside the program? 
think about what are the opportunities available within Henley, which you would be participating or you'd, um, you have certain str strengths or skills which you can add value in terms of the work that we do within the research side or the competitions that we put through, put through together or the kind of societies and clubs that we have where you can, uh, you, you know, your, your, the wider Henley and the wider university community would benefit from. So that's something that we want you to talk about uh, apart from thinking about just your immediate cohort. So of course you want to talk about that, but also the larger community. So th those are the top tips um, in terms of the um, application itself. Again, in terms of guidance, I would say no more than 1,500 words um, uh, and try and make sure that there is clarity, there is structure to your scholarship application as well. If you've got any professional, uh, uh, you know, if you've done any professional qualifications, do make sure you mention about those and any awards or certificates that you've got, um, bring, bring that across on this scholarship application. That's about it really on those uh, two major areas about the scholarship and the program application. Uh, you can stay in touch with us through um, our chat feature. You can chat to our current students and career staff through the Unibody chat and community uh, feature that we have on our website. We, you can also join us at various international webinars that we host uh, as well as face-to-face -face events in India. Um, and if, you, if you'd like to look at all our facilities, do take a, a moment to go on to our virtual campus tour. You'll be able to see all our facilities. And we do have a India officer based out of Bangalore called Kritika Gupta. So do feel free to get in touch with her. That's her email address. That really brings me to the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for such a knowledgeable presentation. We are now moving towards the Q&A session. The first question the student is asking, who are the top employers after completing masters in international business, uh, international business and finance? Thanks, thanks Deepika. Uh, and thanks uh, to the student who asked that question. That's a very good question. Um, our students, um, you know, go on to work in a number of, you know, big names, corporate companies, but they also work in a number of, uh, you know, SMEs or, um, you know, they go on to work in start their own startup or in a startup companies. But if you want to know about the big names, then uh, our students have gone on to work in uh, Microsoft. They've gone on to work in, uh, you know, especially if they've done international business and finance, they've gone on to work in some finance organizations, uh, especially in roles like, uh, you know, the finance, being a finance manager for, um, you know, ac across the uh, region. So they, they're working that kind of international financial financial manager role in companies like um uh sorry uh, barclays wealth management or goldman sachs uh, or um i'm just trying to remember i'm out of uh, uh thing for a second but uh Quite a, quite a few big names. You can find this on our website as well. It's, we don't take down uh, specific course-wise uh, details of where they've gone on to work, but I'm just giving a few names out there, uh, typically within finance-related uh, uh, companies. Thank you. The next question. Can I enroll for Masters in International Business without any work experience? Yes, absolutely. So all uh, the list of programs that I shared previously are all pre-experienced uh, master's program. What that means is that we don't need any work experience for you to come on to this program. But we do tend to see uh, a lot of time students with some experience. But what that means is that you, you'll, you'll find a range of experience from no experience to maybe a couple of years experience on the program. But the, but the answer is no, you don't need work experience. Thank you. The next question. What is the deadline for 2022 intake? Are the classes going on to be face to face? So as an international student, I did say that as early as you can apply, it would be good, especially if you're looking for any scholarship opportunities, there would be deadline dates for these scholarships. Uh, so you do want to keep that into consideration. But let's say you've got your funding sorted, then I would say no later than 1st of June.
especially because you do need to think about there are other aspects like your accommodation, your visa and things like that that you'll have to still sort after you have applied. And also the admissions will take at least, um, you know, a couple of weeks or sometimes longer, as I said, up to four weeks time. So you do want to give yourself enough time to get the required decision in time to be able to apply for other things. Um, an example here is that the accommodations deadline here is the 1st of August. If you want to be guaranteed uh, an accommodation with the university, uh, then you will have to have a uh, accepted your offer, paid the deposit, and applied for the accommodation before the 1st of August. Now, if you apply any later than the 1st of June, keep a, keeping four weeks duration from there, you would probably miss the accommodation deadline. So those are the kind of things that you want to remember. I hope thank that you. answers the question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. The next question, I have one year of gap after my graduation. Can I apply for business masters? Yes, you should be able to apply. That's not necessarily always uh, an issue. Um, what we do like to know, though, is what you've done during the gap year. Sometimes people take up, um, you know, voluntary work, or they are, or they are going through a training course, or they. They're keeping themselves occupied with something. Or it might be that your personal situation um, didn't really uh, provide you that kind of uh, space to be able to do something which might add value to your studies. But we want to understand what that uh, was, what the situation was, what stopped you from doing something about, um, you know, prepping for your course. So you do want to try and um, talk about it in brief, again, very much in brief in your personal statement, if you've got a gap year, what you've done during the gap year to strengthen your profile. Thank you. The next question, what IELTS score do you require? Can I apply without IELTS? Uh, so we require IELTS for most programs, 6.5 overall with no elements less than six. If you're looking for information management and digital business programs like big data, um, uh, then, then we're looking for 6.5 with no elements less than uh, 5.5. Uh, we do accept IELTS waiver for students from India based on their 12th English score. So yes, providing a 12th in mark, mark sheet at the stage of application will help us see if you are eligible for an exemption. Thank you. The next question. Are you hosting career days during the master's program? Absolutely. Yes, we do have a very important I mean, careers is an integral part of our uh, programs. And it's not just career development, but it's also personal development. So they're integrated and they are integral part of the Henley's master's courses. So there are a number of um, you know, uh, events, fairs, and different ways in which the careers team engage with you. And they engage not just at the end, but right from the beginning of the program. So you'll find yourself having a career-related activity pretty much every, every week, but sometimes every other day. We do have, uh, we do invite uh, companies uh, for placements, uh, you know, a few times during the year, uh, generally once at the beginning, then once sometime in the spring term, and then uh, a, a couple of times in the summer term. So yes, there will be that but also throughout the year, you'll, you'll be meeting uh, with these companies in other formats. For example, we, we have employer panel sessions. So we, we call recruiters uh, from agencies as well as recruiters from within company to come and talk to our students about what the current UK uh, market looks like, job market looks like, what are the kind of skills that the employers are interested in. It, it's not just um, your work experiences, but there might be transferable skills that they might be willing to look at. And what are those? Those So they'll come and talk to you about all of these things. And it's a great way of building your network. So there will be networking events as well, um, where, we'll, uh, where we'll invite industry professionals. So there might be guest lecture. That might be another format through which we might call them. Uh, our, uh, there is also careers uh, counselors who can help you map your career journey of what you're looking for, what your strengths are, what 
what your previous skills or experiences are and with the masters where what kind of roles you should be targeting so you have um, unlimited access to the career counseling uh, sessions and also the career service is available not just for the year that you're studying but the four years after you've graduated as well so you can keep coming back even after you've graduated, even after you've landed on a job, if in case you're looking for the next step, in case if you're looking for what else after and what kind of things I should do to, uh, to grow as a person or to grow in this kind of roles that you're looking for, they can help you map that. So that uh, hopefully that kind of gives you not just answer to your question, but also in a nutshell, everything about a career team. Any other questions, Deepika? Thank you. Yes, we have many questions. So uh, the another one is, uh, what are what are my job prospects after completing this course? That's a good question, but that really depends on the on the program of your interest. And this is where I said you should do your research. Um, every program and with the kind of pathways or optional modules that you've got, the kind of career roles that you, you might be targeting or the, uh, it's not just the program outcome, but also the career roles are kind of aligned with with the choices you make of the program. So it's very important you look at this on our website and that information is available on our website. And if in case you feel that that's, to, that's not necessarily addressing your question, then um, I would encourage you to uh, you know, ask these questions to our careers team who are professionals and experts in the career side. Um, uh, on, on the Unibody uh, community platform, which is on our website. So you, you're seeing chat to our student. It's the same link. It takes you to the, um, to the Unibody chat platform, but you can further from there, you can download the Unibody community and you can ask questions there to the careers team. So to the, the short answer is that the prospects or, of the rules or careers that you're targeting will really depend on your previous experiences and your previous skills and your previous degree, along with uh, the program of your uh, the program you've chose and what how the design the structure of the program that it has and what that means after. So do do take time to research that on the website. Thank you. The next question: What is the fee structure? Can I pay my fees in installments? So um, the, in terms of the fee structure, the program, the cost of the program varies slightly across different programs. So I'll, I'll say the range is anywhere between £23,000 to £26,000. Now our finance programs are slightly on the higher side, the ICMA finance programs, they are usually in the range of twenty four to twenty six thousand plus uh, while the business and management program are in the range of 23,000 to 24,000 pounds the information management might be slightly um, on the uh, uh, lower side of the price point uh, so that's the range and in terms of the uh, payment options you can pay either in full before you start in September, or you can pay half before you start in September. And the second half uh, can be paid before you start your second term, which is usually mid-January. That's when you'll have the uh, deadline for paying your second half of your fees. Now, remember, although we accept payment in uh, to installments, you will still have to show that you're able to fund for your program uh, while you're making your visa application. So there are two separate things. Make sure you do show that you've got all the funds necessary um, for your visa purpose. Thank you. The next question. Please tell about the admission process for MBA. What is the average age of students attending your MBA program? What about the post-study work visa? Okay. So in terms of the MBA program, it is... Um, it is a post-experience program for us, a post-experience master's program. The minimum uh, experience that we're looking for for our MBA program is a three years management experience. So it's not just three years work experience, but management experience. And what we mean by that management experience is not just the title of manager, but more in lines of what you've done in terms of the responsibilities within your role, whatever that is. Um, so it means that you could be a specialist or you could be very technical in your role without uh, the designation of manager, but 
the kind of responsibilities you've taken. An example here is maybe uh, you, you've been given budgets to manage, uh, although you're not a regional, ma although you're not managers, you know, whatever kind of designation within your company that might be, uh, you, you don't hold that title, but you manage budgets. And you've done that for over three years of time, then that might be one of the few criteria that we have of what we define as management experience that you're fulfilling. Now, we we have about seven of those criteria, which is available on the website. And we would like to see that you meet at least four of those and you have you show consistency of that over three years period. So that's what we say, three years management experience, the average age or the average experience, average age of the uh, student on MBA program is about 30, uh, 30 plus, sometimes it's 32, sometimes it's 35. It varies year on year, uh, but that's the average uh, age. Average experience is about 10 years experience. Uh, again, that kind of varies sometimes with, you know, between 10 and 12. But I, if I just say as 10 years as, as, as an average, that would be good enough. Sorry, what was the last part of that question, Deepika? Uh, they want to know about the post-study work visa. Okay. Now, uh, with the UK, if you're not already aware, the UK VHI made decision a couple of years back that they they are going to open up and provide two years stay back option um, for students who pursue a master's program um, of twelve months duration or more. So, which means that uh, you can apply for the graduate immigration route. It's now, it's not called post-study work visa anymore. It's called graduate immigration route. So you're, you're eligible to apply for that. Um, generally, if you've taken a master's program and stay back for two years and find a job, uh, you don't need to show that a company uh, is sponsoring you. You can find a, a, a job afterwards. You just need to get the uh, you just need to apply for the graduate immigration route. Now, I'm going to say here that for our MBA program, uh, the, the program that we offer is part-time MBA program. They're executive, uh, ex executive MBA programs, and they're offered as part-time over 24 months or 30 months. So it doesn't follow the same route as the normal uh, pre-experience master's program, which are usually in the duration of nine months or 12 months. Um, this is slightly different. So the, um, the visa uh, or the post-study work visa might, might not be necessarily always relevant to this one. You will have to check and you will have to uh, ask a, a, you know, a visa expert. I'm not an expert in that area. So I'd probably suggest you, you get in touch with uh, somebody who can advise you on visa. Thank you. So the next student, uh, Nidhi Gupta, she's very keen to know many things and she has six questions. Uh, so let me go to these questions one by one. The first question is, I have an offer with Henley Business School. I need information about accommodation and scholarship. Is a, a conditional offer to meet English requirement? I have six as score. Okay. Uh, good to know, Nidhi, that you've held an offer. Congratulations. Uh, now, to talk about accommodations, there's plenty of accommodation uh, available through the university. Uh, and when I say plenty in the sense that we've got uh, lots of options available and lots of a lot of facilities on campus as well as off campus. So we've got uh, the option of self-catered or catered. We've got the option of townhouses or hall of residence. We've got options of everything from shared kitchen, shared bathroom to premium en suites of family accommodation. This means that depending on what your budget is, you can plan and, and your lifestyle, what, what minimum things you need. You know, you can draw and you can look at options that are available to you. You can apply for these uh, as soon as you have an offer, whether you've got conditional or unconditional. Uh, of course, you will uh, have to have accepted your offer and uh, paid the deposit uh, and then applied for the accommodation. Um, now, you, when you're applying for accommodation, you will be asked to give three choices and we will try and aim to give your first choice. But if let's say that we've filled out um, that accommodation because 
it was very popular, then we will give you the second one of your choice. So which is why we ask for three choices from you. We also ask you whether you want to go for a 41 week or a 51 week contract. But you'll find all this information once you start applying for the accommodation. I'll leave the link to accommodation page um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, um, in the chat box. Um, so hopefully that's an overview of the accommodations. Now, talking about the next question uh, about scholarships, I think I've given uh, a brief about the scholarships that are available. Um, this is the full list of Henley scholarships that are available. If you've not applied for this already, now that you hold an offer, I definitely encourage you to apply for the scholarship. You don't need to have accepted your offer as yet. You can apply for scholarship and you can then do. Of course, there will be a deadline date for your um, accept, accepting your place on the program. So you'll need to meet that if you're dependent on scholarship or uh, you know scholarship then you would want to make sure that you leave us um, an email saying that your uh, acceptance will be dependent on the scholarship uh, but this is the full list of uh, the scholarships that are available with Henley I'll also remind that you've got the centenary scholarship over here that I mentioned um, the second deadline date for which is 15th of June so do apply for both you'll once you go into the me at Reading portal, you will find all the scholarships that are relevant to you available on the portal. So you, all you need to do is just make your application. And one, it's only one application for both Centenary and the subject scholarships. Uh, so that's about the scholarship. Sorry, Deepika, what was the last part of the question? Yeah, actually she has scored six in her IELTS exam. So is it conditional offer to meet English requirement? I have six as score. Um, Okay, uh, one thing I'd say is, Nidhi, if possible, if you do meet the 12th English cutoff uh, that I gave for, um, I gave before, then you can email your documents across to me, that's all to the uh, admissions team, that's 70% for CBSE or ICSE, or 75% for other boards. So if you, in case, if you meet this, then I'd suggest you you can you send your 12th mark sheet in case you don't meet this then uh, you will have to reappear unless um, you do want to take a pre-sessional English course at uh, at the university it will be at an additional cost but you might be you know because it's a half band difference you might be looking at a shorter duration of maybe four weeks or 11 weeks uh, we'll have to discuss that with the admissions team of what would be relevant to you. But you might want to take up that in case you don't want to reappear for the IELTS. Uh, but we, I'm happy to have this as an offline conversation with you. Um, yeah, to interrupt Vishali, she's saying that uh, her 12th is way back in 1997, may not be relevant. Um, the year does not really matter. We, we are not saying that we're looking at uh, only the last few years, 12, those of, who've graduated. We understand that, and that's not a problem. You can provide so long as you meet the cutoff. Thank you. The next question she's asking, how long it takes to get cash and un uh, unconditional offer? Okay, so in terms of the CAS, generally, they will be provided to you uh, somewhere in June and latest by July. Um, so you don't need to do anything much so long as you have accepted your place on the program, you've paid the deposit, you will be included when the CAS will, will, uh, will be issued. The admissions will come around it in, we, we're not allowed to, generate CAS uh, because of the UKBI guidelines to, to the university, we're not able to generate that any earlier than certain duration, which is usually about three, four months. So they will be given to you. Uh, I would say wait until June, mid-June to somewhere in mid-July. If you don't get uh, by that time, then get in touch with us. Thank you. She wants to, uh, she wants to, she wants your email. Yeah, for like further communication. Also, SIUK India will also be uh, present there if, if you have any question related to the Henley Business School or any kind of ed admission. Absolutely. Deepika, if you can pass on my email address, that sure. would be great. Um, I'm also going to say that I and my colleague, uh, Kritika, who's based in India, uh, 
either of us would be able to help you. I'll send you my email address, but I've already shared here. This is Kritika's email address. You can always get in touch with Kritika as well. She's based out of Bangalore. So in your time zone to be able to help you, not just with this question, but with anything else. Also, Kritika is an alumni. She studied her master's in entrepreneurship program. So there's other things that she can help you with if they're in terms of, um, you know, what, what her experiences were living uh, in, in Reading. I mean, I live in Reading, but she would have a different take because uh, she came here, uh, you know, right after, uh, you know, or, or it was a first trip and, you know, what, what kind of challenges she faced or what, what was the best part of her uh, experience living in Reading. So these are kind, kind of things that she could also share with you or the program, how she, how she felt uh, having studied at Henley and things like that. So if you want do feel free to get in touch with her. Thank you, Vaishali. The next question is, do you have discounts on early bird application or accommodation? Now, um, no, we don't have that necessarily uh, for Henley Business School. The two funding opportunities we've got is uh, first one, scholarships, and second is the bursaries. Now, scholarships are uh, merit-based bursaries of financial need base. The only thing I'd mention is if you are already a Henley or alumni or a university alumni, there might be an alumni discount that you might be eligible for. But these are the three options really that, that are available in terms of funding support from, your, from, our, from our side. Thank you. The next question, what is the visa deadline? Also, uh, yes. What is the popular postgraduate course in Henley Business School? Okay, in terms of the visa deadline, I'm afraid I am not the best person to give you that kind of advice. I'd probably suggest you get in touch with your SIUK counsellor. Uh, they, they are experts in that area and they'd be able to tell you. Also, it will be uh, dependent on what the local situation is within terms of the appointment, etc. So they, they are in a better position to help you with all of those aspects. Um, from our end, I think um, what we do want is, is the student has applied for their visa in good time. As I said, we will we will provide you with the CAS if you've met all the conditions for us to be able to issue you the CAS. And from that, you plan sufficiently and you apply in a way that you have your visa in place before the start of the program. Now, generally, when I uh, the start of the program is around mid-September, second or third week of September. And um, the first couple of weeks is your induction week and your classes actual program module relates uh, related um, classes will start by the 1st of October usually. So you do want to ensure that you, as far as possible, you arrive by the second or third of week, the exact start date. If you just cannot, then no later than the 1st of October. So you want to consult with your SIUK counselor of how soon you should be applying. Uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Deepika? Yeah, actually she wants to know about the uh, deadline for visa. No, I've addressed that. I'm not able to give the exact uh, date, and but there was another question attached to that. No, actually, yeah, it was related to the part-time jobs and internship. Basically, many okay. students want to know about the part-time job sure. uh, of, uh, during the course, not after the course. During sure. the course, will there be any assistance and what are the part-time jobs available for the students? Sure. So um, you're able to work for up to 20 hours per week. And uh, there are, generally speaking, plenty of jobs, uh, you know, available for part time, flexible, uh, which are more relevant to students um, who are pursuing studies available on campus as well as off campus within Reading or in nearby, near to Reading. So uh, you can take up any of those. Now, if you want to know where you can find these jobs, um, the first uh, place I would say you look at is the RUSU, which is the Red, um, the University Student Union. They run a job shop on campus. So I would suggest you get in touch with them to find out about all the opportunities, but also to float your CV. Now, 
therefore we will have to write your cv and you can get help from your career counselors to write those uh, to write your cv which would be which would be as good as possible for as many flexible roles that you can apply for but also your own career team might come to know about certain short projects which are paid uh, but are in flexible hours by certain companies like there's smes on campus on the white knights campus um, these smes sometimes have uh, certain openings and exam example, maybe data entry job, you know, that can be done at flexible hours and um, they, 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 might, they might be open to you because of the kind of skill set, skill set that you've got. So um, make sure you get in touch with both your careers team, with the university's careers team, as well as the student union run job shop on campus. Thank you, Vaishali. The next question. Do we need to submit personal statement along with the application? What are the job prospectors in the sports management course? Okay. Yeah. Um, the answer to your question, yes, personal statement is a primary and a mandatory document as part of your application. Um, it, it tells us your motivation to study with us, your motivation to study the program, uh, your, the research you've done, basically, that, that tells us everything about you. So it's very important uh, that you provide that at the stage of application. Um, now, in terms of um, sports management, we do not offer a specific course within sports management, but we do offer MSc management program, which is a broad program, which allows students from, uh, which allows students to work in different industries, be it sports industry or fashion or pharmaceuticals or IT or wherever they are targeting. The idea is that you look at management in a more broader sense. You think about leadership, about ethics, about sustainability, about, um, all these aspects, strategies, you know, you think about this in a more broader sense um, and, and you draw experiences if your peers have them in those industries, if they have come from those industries. And if not, you pick up case studies or you pick up uh, things that are relevant to you and you, you bring that into the classroom for discussion purpose. So you're tailoring and you're getting the kind of knowledge that you need more specifically uh, or, relevant, or that's relevant to you. Uh, so although we don't provide that sports management program, I'm going to say that our MSc management program should prepare you well enough to apply everything that you're learning in any industry that you're targeting. Thank you. The next question. The student is asking, what is the average earning after doing Henley master's course or Henley master programs? Uh, that's a good, good, very good question. It's just unfortunately that it's it's such a broad uh, question that it's very difficult to say, um, you know, that it's relevant to to the student specific student uh, because they might. Uh, the salary levels can slightly vary between students who are looking at jobs in the UK versus those who are looking abroad internationally, or sometimes students do go back to their home countries and um, uh, they, they pick up roles there and, and the salary range can vary. Uh, so, uh, and also the field, you know, the, the, the area that you go to work to, it is also dependent on their prior experience. For example, somebody who is on the program with five years experience and has done certain, has, has dealt with certain kind of responsibilities might fetch a different role than somebody who's a fresh graduate. So the, it's, it's a very personal thing. And so it's very difficult to say uh, an average salary. But what I can say is that most master's students um, who do stay back in the UK get um, a graduate, you know, a graduate salary uh, relevant to the UK job market, which is, <coughs> sorry, which is about twenty five thousand pounds or so. Sorry, I'm going to have to grab some water. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of cough and cold. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, coming back. Um, so yeah, that's the range we're talking about. Certain uh, <clears throat> certain courses might fetch slightly higher uh, salary as well in the range of twenty nine thousand pounds. 
<coughs> Sorry. I'm going to have to take a quick break, Deepika. Is that okay? Deepika, I'm back. Okay. Yeah, so Vishali, we have covered all the questions from the chat box. Many thanks for answering all the questions so well. No problem. And sharing your knowledge with us. We are now moving towards the end of the seminar. We, I would request if you have anything else you want to highlight or put forward for the audience who are watching us live right now. Um, thanks, Deepika. Well, uh, the only thing I'm going to say is that um, the purpose of today's session was to kind of highlight how important uh, it is for Henley that we see a student who is well researched. Um, and that means that you've, you know why you're coming to us, what we would offer to you, you're, you have that clarity. Uh, and, the, and this goes down to the point that maybe you've read about the kind of research we do or the faculties. Um, <clears throat> their background, their profile. So if you've done that, that kind of research, do make sure you bring it across in your application. Do make sure that you highlight everything that you bring to the program, um, <clears throat> because that would definitely be something that the Henley would be look, uh, the business school will be looking for, the admissions officer will be looking for uh, in, in your application. And that would stand out uh, when you're making a scholarship application as well. Uh, and we would encourage for such students, you know, if you've got good academics or a balanced academic, um, you know, uh, degree, uh, you may not be, you know, a first class with distinction, but you've got something else to offer and this kind of motivation, then, then we would recommend that you make a scholarship application and we'd be happy to give you a higher value because we, you, you are the kind of student we're looking for. And another thing I'll highlight is that make sure you apply as early as possible. Once we've given away the scholarships, uh, we're not able to uh, support you, even if you're a brilliant candidate. If we've exhausted the funds, even if you have got a first class with distinction and five years experience and something else to offer, unfortunately, you've come too late to us and we're not able to support you. And we're not able to recognize you the way we would have otherwise. So make sure you, uh, you apply in good time, make sure you do your research and get in touch with us if you have any questions. Uh, you have Kritika's email address right on your screen. Uh, you'll have my email address. Uh, you have other formats through which you can get in touch. Uh, so make sure you do that. Have conversation with us. Keep, keep us informed about uh, how you're uh, getting on with your application. So yeah, I look forward to hear from you guys. That, that's about it for me. Thank you for your kind words to all the audience. If you have any further question, please feel free to reach out to Kritika Vishali or our SIUK India offices. We'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you so much in the end. Thank you so much, everyone, for your valuable time today. And I, and I wish Vishali will get well soon. Thanks, Deepika. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. Bye. Take care.